You shall love the Lord with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. When I was working in the Catholic Center, just several blocks from here, you know, being in a corporate environment, you run into a lot of people throughout the day in the elevator and through the halls, and people say, how are you doing? And sometimes they get tired of just saying, fine, I want to give something a little more honest. Some days I'm doing more fine than others. And so the response that just came to mind, just out of the heart, was, well, better than I deserve. Because that was a response that was always true, no matter how I felt. And, but I noticed that over time, there were two responses that I got to that statement. And uh, in the elevator, sometimes people would say, oh, well, I'm sure you deserve lots of good things. Other people would say, amen to that, me too, better, always better than I deserve. <laughs> and so which, which response shows more understanding of the gospel? Now, it is a truism, you might say, that law keepers deserve more than law breakers. And so we have a passage today where we have the law addressed for us, where Jesus gives the summary, what we now call the summary of the law. And so in this passage, we have a scribe which comes to him. And actually, it's not clear in this passage, it's a little bit more clear in the parallel passage that we have in Matthew. He actually comes to test him. And so in doing so, he says, which is the greatest commandment? And he gives this summary of the law. You still love the Lord with all your heart. I'm paraphrasing, love your neighbor as yourself. And he, he responds favorably. The scribe says that you answered rightly. And Jesus' response is, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Now in hearing this, especially uh, several years ago, I would pause a little bit, actually, in seeing Jesus' response because, gee, doesn't Jesus make a radical departure from the law? We're saved by grace, not by the law. We're all lawbreakers. Uh, but he quotes what is very familiar in the Old Testament and says to this man, you are not far from the kingdom of God. So you understand the the what I was getting at when I was saying to people in the elevator, I'm better than, I'm, than I deserve. I'm basically a lawbreaker. As a reminder to myself as much as anything else, but it's also would help to frame my disposition towards others. Uh, but we, and we'll come back to that in a moment, how, how our disposition towards God affects our disposition towards others. But here in this passage, Jesus identifies with this law. As, as bringing us close to the kingdom. Which raises some questions for us as to the continuity of the law with, our, with the gospel. So let's look at the command in context. Let's look at the continuity, and then let's see the completion that we have in our Lord Jesus Christ. What we'll see is that from this scribe, we have something to learn from him, in that he has come close to the kingdom, we want to be close to the kingdom, but yet we want the whole kingdom. So how can we make sure that we, we, are, we fully embrace that in how we relate to God as well as how we relate to others? So the context is the commandments. And in our passage, Jesus is disputing, uh, well, Jesus isn't disputing, rather, that he comes to the people who are disputing matters of the law. Why are they disputing matters of the law? Well, because it's their faith, of course, and religious people tend to dispute with one another. Uh, there are 619 commandments in the Old Testament. Do we dispute about the law in this way? Well, it's our faith. I mean, we still have these commandments in our scriptures that we still embrace. Well, it might be analogous to this. Uh, the way we tend to dispute about the Mass, <laughs> about what is the right kind of Mass to go to, the way we approach the Mass, uh, the, way, the way we worship Mass. 
which, which helps to under, us to understand the law a little bit as well, to understand the true context here. We often look at the law in the sense that, oh, in the Old Testament, the law was how they attained righteousness before God, by law keeping. But we, of course, are saved by grace, by Jesus. He's the one who saves us. Well, that's a real, really an oversimplification of how the Old Testament, how the law worked in the Old Testament. The law was essentially the identity of the people. They knew they couldn't keep all these commandments, but the fact that they wanted to, the fact that it was important to them, marked them out as God's people, people of the commandment. In a similar way where we're people of the mass, where you're here this morning to say, this is what I belong to, this is who I am. And, uh, and this produces a lot of thought, a lot of, a lot of debate as, as to how the best way we are to do this. So that's the context of the commandment and some analogy to where we are today. And Jesus picks up with this, showing some continuity with the commandments in the sense that he quotes the most famous commandment, um, uh, uh, the question to him, what is the most important commandment? And he gives what we know as the Shema. Hear, O Israel. The Shema is just Hebrew for hear. And uh, so that was quoted for us in our readings here today. And he says, hear, O Israel. He quotes it right, to, right back to him. The Lord our God. The Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And then he adds, and with all your strength. And then he adds, he says, the second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And so here he connects the love of neighbor with the love of God. Now this is something that was not expli an explicit connection in the Old Testament. It's certainly there. I mean, it, it's, it's certainly in the witness of the Old Testament because he's drawing from this. But to put these two together, however, is what is maybe we wouldn't say unique, but is the, the clarity that he brings to the question. And he actually brings a fairly obscure passage from Leviticus. And in Leviticus, we read in chapter 19, you shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason with your neighbor, lest you bear sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear any grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. And then you shall keep my statutes. You shall not your cattle breed with any different kind. And he goes on. And so here we have the scribe who teaches us by his response to this. He shows us humility and the heart of true religion. The humility in the sense that he came to dispute with Jesus, but yet he gives a point to his opponent. In our polarized time, this is helpful. He loves truth enough to be teachable, even though this makes it so that he doesn't have the upper hand with his opponent. He recognizes truth, and in humility, he's able to receive it. Uh, so humility is important. Uh, but then we have the heart of true religion, which is ultimately goodness, holiness. He recognizes that, that as his, in his response, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, yes. There is no other but he, of course. And to love him with all the heart and then to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all the burnt offerings and the sacrifices. He gets to the point. What we call the beauty of holiness, the holiness that we have in worship transforms our lives. But the question then is how? <laughs> because Jesus says, you are not far from the kingdom of God. He says this with respect. He says, you answered wisely. He honors this scribe. But the kingdom is not fully achieved yet. And so how is the kingdom completed? We've looked at the context of the commandments, the continuity. Where is the completion? And brothers and sisters, look, you know, we have in many ways, in the way, the way we relate to others, the way we relate to God, is essentially the way the scribe does. We hear in the beginning of our Mass every week, this, this same summary of the law. <laughs> and what is our response to this? Oh yes, this is, this is the heart of what we're here for. This is what the heart of what God comes to us for. 
And, but at times, we have this, um, well, at least I. Underneath our thinking, whether you're articulating it this way or not, we all have a way of saying, well, at least I do this. Uh, I, I'm coming to God. I, I didn't live a perfect week. I didn't live perfectly this week. Uh, but at least I came to Mass. And if there's any at least I in your heart, then you are not embracing the full truth of God's kingdom. For on one hand, it's very clear that we know this is true of Israel, uh, that they did not love God with all their heart. Uh, we see this so dramatically in the Old Testament where God gives them the commandments, you shall have no other gods besides me, <laughs> and they immediately start to grumble. <laughs> very soon they're going after other gods, literal gods, Baals and the like. And then, should you, do you love your neighbor as yourself? There was a law in the Old Testament, right? perhaps you all are familiar with it, uh, or a command, it's the jubilee, every 10 years, to forgive your debts one to another, set the slaves free. Did they ever do this? No, they never did that. They never celebrated the jubilee, which was, is in a, would have been the epitome of, of loving one's neighbor, uh, forgiving everything. But do you do these things? Of course we don't. I mean, on one level, we know we don't love God with all our heart, nor do we love our neighbor as ourselves, truly, um, in, in any way. So where do we go with this? You know, oftentimes, even if you know better, here's what we do. We fall into this, this idea that I believe, and so I obey, therefore I am saved. That, of course, is not the gospel. What Jesus shows us is you believe, you are saved, therefore you obey. I hope this isn't new to you, but this is something that we need to reappropriate on a regular basis. It's something worth reappropriating every time we come to the Mass, certainly every time we come to the summary of the law and we realize that we are completely empty-handed. We have nothing to bring to our Lord. So we come here that he might fill us. And so we come to our Lord Jesus Christ, who, yes, who is God, but who is our neighbor. He is the perfect neighbor. Think of the prodigal son, or rather the Good Samaritan parable, and the one who is on the ground. We want to be good Samaritans, the one who is willing to help the one on the ground. But we can look at this through many different angles. We are on the ground and Jesus is the one who helped us. Right? He is the good neighbor who saves us. But more than that, no, no, he is the one who is on the ground. He is the one who was dead. Do we come to him? He is the one who has a good neighbor laid down his life for us first. <laughs> and so we hear in John, greater love hath no man than this, but that he lay down his life for his friends. That is what it means to be a good neighbor. And none of us, none of us has done that. None of us has been a good neighbor. But it's because of our Lord Jesus Christ who showed the love of God. You might say this represents the vertical the vertical bar on the cross, love of God pointing vertically to the Lord. He gave everything. None of us has given everything. But then the horizontal bar, love of neighbor, he poured out everything for us. And so in this way, he becomes, he shows the love of God, the love of neighbor that we could never do. And so, Paul tells us in Romans 5, 8, for a good man, for a good man, one might scarcely dare to die. But the love of God is shown in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, while we had nothing to offer. Is that one point in time? No, that is every point in time. At every point in time, we're still sinners. At every point in time, ultimately, we have nothing to give and he died for us. But that 
ideally causes a radical reorientation in how we relate to our neighbor. After all, I think we can grasp this as we're coming to Mass, we're coming here, and we understand that there's a representation of the sacrifice at the altar. But the question is, do you carry this with you when you relate to your neighbor? So I think we can get pretty quickly that reminder that yes, we come to God bringing nothing. We come to God empty-handed. But as you interact with others during the week, as you have an opportunity to interact with your neighbor, do you still see yourself as somebody who has nothing to offer? Or do you compare? And do you at times say, well, at least I, at least I do this compared to you? If so, then you are unable to love your neighbor. We are unable to love our neighbor unless we realize that we are utterly desperate. <laughs> and more desperate than our neighbor because we might think we see our neighbor's sins, but no one sees our own sins the way we do. No one, no one sees the depth of what God has paid for than you do for yourself. In this sense, we have a new command. Love others as I have loved you. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. Which we also hear in, God's, in John's Gospel, which gives clarity to what it means to truly receive the kingdom of God. So, are you just close to the kingdom like the scribe? Are you, are you in the kingdom? Now, to be fair, if you're baptized, you are in the kingdom. <laughs> you have received this. You've received this love. You have been, you, sacramentally, you have received Christ in you. But unless you understand that you are an utter beggar before him, and as you relate to others, then you're not bringing forward the kingdom that you have received. You're not much more good than the scribe who is merely close to the kingdom in how you relate to others. So what's the solution? The solution is simply to become another Christ. The very one, the only one who showed us love to God the vertical aspect of the cross, and the only one who showed love of the neighbor, both by giving his life, only by receiving his life in you, can you then pour out your life continually for others. That is the sacramental exchange that we receive at the Mass. And it comes not magically, not just by going forward, but by appropriating this, by meditating on this, by owning this anew throughout every day, by remembering what happened today throughout every moment of the week. So our Lord, when he, so to look at the, the continuity of the law, he doesn't do away with the law, he makes it even greater. Think of the Beatitudes. You know, if someone asks for your cloak, give them both. If someone asks you to go one mile, go two. How can we do this? Only by laying down our lives. Um, only if Christ is in you. And you understand that how can you not serve these other unworthy people when God has served you who are unworthy? And so this is why in the Eastern Church, after communion, after receiving Christ, the Beatitudes are sung as the people receive communion and afterwards. And we're just talking about this this week. This is something that we'll soon be implementing here as well. So that not only do we receive the sacrament, but we appropriate it. We own it, we claim it, we live it. And in this way, when we, when we look towards others, when we look before God, and people say, how are you? And you can truly say, better than I deserve. And that cultivates a greater love for God, but also a greater love for neighbor. Let's receive undeservingly and then give to others who are undeserving as well.